Welcome back, animal lovers, to Awakening with Your Animal Family. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Schoen, and I'm really excited to see you all here again and to have a very special guest who you've met before on the show, Dr. Susan Wagner, an absolutely brilliant veterinary neurologist, board certified, and a dear colleague and friend. And today, we're going to talk about something that so many animal lovers and clients have asked about for quite a few years now is what's going on with CBD, hemp oil, different products like that that are on the market now for both humans and animals. And what we're going to share, what Dr. Wagner is going to share is everything you want to know, almost everything you want to know or afraid to ask about CBD, hemp oil, and things like that because it really varies depending upon what state you're in, what country you're in, um, what you're allowed to say. We as veterinarians, you know, it, aren't allowed to say much about it, you know? And um, it's been uh, very hotly debated in the veterinary world, what we can do, what we can say, yet it's at many and more and more major veterinary conferences. And I'm so excited because Dr. Wagner presents these lectures at the veterinary conferences on the scientific basis, the difference between dogs and cats, what you can use, what you can't use. And, you know, I have to say, we were just chuckling about on the before the show uh, chat that way back when in my early years as a veterinarian, I was practicing for a couple of years in a hippie college town in upstate New York. And no one talked about pot CBD back then for animals. And I was on call every other night. And one night I had a call and this dog kind of looked quite happy, but falling over and walking in. And I was doing a major workup. And then I saw that they were happy-go-lucky hippies. And I just kind of put the pieces of puzzle together and you know, it was back completely illegal back then. And I just kind of judiciously, diplomatically started asking, hey, was there any possibility that there might have been some pot or something around? And then they gave each other little smirks and were hesitant to say. And then finally they said, look, I'm not going to, I said, I'm not going to report you. I just, it would help for me to figure out what's going on with your dog. And then they said they, it was, and I helped them through and the dog came through fine. Uh, but these days, especially in states where it's completely legal, we're seeing more and more cases in poison control centers and emergency centers where the animals have ingested it and are having some of the side effects. So we're going to talk about side effects, dangers, indications, contraindications, all of that. You know, and I have to say, not that I was prescribing it to my clients, but, you know, I've had dogs... Uh, that, you know, we're hopeless that, you know, I won a few years ago that had a, went through an MRI at a major referral center, was diagnosed with a pituitary gland tumor. It was 14, 15 years old, and it was blind, falling over, deaf, and the woman could barely afford the MRI, but did it because she loved her dog. So then she goes, he doesn't need, he doesn't do anything. I can't afford all the chemo, all of this, and I don't know what to do. And I said, look, you know, I can't say anything. You know, you were asking me about CBD, you need to look it up. But when we look at the research, there are some indications for it apparently with neurologic disease, with cancer, with things like that. So they ended up doing it on their own, not prescribed by me or anything. And the next time I went to the horse barn, that same dog that was falling over, that was blind and deaf, was running around, playing, eating, happy-go-lucky. And I went, wow. And they said, look, and this is amazing. And uh, they said, you know, yeah, he couldn't even eat. So we decided we had nothing to lose. And we tried it on our own. And we started giving the CBD. And the dog's running and playing. and. I said, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that information. The dog ended up living another year and a half till it was 16, you know, and in fine shape and in great quality of life. That was the dog that started opening my mind that, wow, it looks like there's 
potential use benefits of this in veterinary medicine. And then I started reading and studying and hearing different lectures and, you know, doing, I'm not, I'm retired from active veterinary practice. So I can't, pres I don't prescribe it or anything, but um, it's enough that I think we as animal lovers really need to be as educated as possible about this. And so that's why uh, Dr. Wagner and I, when we were chatting said, wow, she has all the lectures, she gives this, she's a neurologist, uh, this is perfect. So thanks, thank you, Dr. Wagner, welcome back to the show. And I'm so excited to have you here again. And um, my, the audience loves you and it's just, I love the rapport that we have going back and forth. And with that, I'll just allow you to, you know, get started with your lecture. And then if there are questions that I have or that uh, Brie, our amazing tech diva goddess who runs all of Awake TV's technology. And thank you, Brie, for being here. If she has any questions from the audience, we'll throw those out too. So welcome back. It's a joy to have you. And um, away we go. Everything or almost everything that we wanted to know about CBD and hemp oil that we were afraid to ask. Great, great, great. Thanks so much. Oops, sorry, I'm gone already here. There we go. Um, yeah, thanks very much for having me back. It's it's great to be here. And we're gonna talk about all those things. And, and first we're gonna talk about the system, the reason in our bodies that the CBD would even work. And I think that's the miraculous part of it. So bear with me, I'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint so that if folks wanna jot down a few notes at home, they can do that. So let me um, share the screen and then you guys will see the PowerPoint here real soon. Oh, that is awesome because as I always say, the goal of this show, one of the goals besides creating a global movement, the calm movement, which we'll chat about more, but um, is to educate to and empower animal lovers. So understanding the scientific basis of all this is the foundation for all the education and empowerment. Right. I mean, and it's, it's, you know, you can get really, really into it and, but yet anybody can understand this. So um, I, I just think it's really fascinating. And, and my story with it is that, you know, several years ago when CBD hit the market, I was still practicing a lot. And um, I was hoping that maybe it would help my epileptics because, you know, I would see the worst of the worst. And it was kind of like, eh, a couple of them got a little better, you know? So I just kind of went, eh, yeah, because it was expensive. And I figured in terms of cancer and, and arthritis and inflammation, I had other tools. So I just sort of let it go. Um, and then about a year ago or so, I was watching a webinar and this physician was talking about cannabis medical cannabis and CBD and all that. And he said that the brain has more receptors in it for cannabinoids than any other neurotransmitter. And it was like somebody smacked me upside the head and I thought, I had to replay it. And I thought, all right, I'm a neurologist and this is too important for me not to pay attention to. So that's when I dove into all the literature and, and to try to understand it. And I just couldn't believe how fascinating this is. So hopefully everybody else will get a feel for how fascinating it is as well. So, so this, this system, how did it get its name? Because you think, well, how did we know to name this system um, after cannabis? And what happened was all those kind of hippie folks that you were talking about a minute ago, um, scientists knew that, all right, they would smoke or eat this, this plant and it would have these properties, um, psychoactive properties. So they set out to reverse engineer this and figure out, all right, what receptors are in there? What's it doing to the brain? And so when they figured all this out, they named that whole system after cannabis. That's how it got its name. Um, and so the really fascinating thing about this is that if you think of other body systems, like the cardiovascular system, right, it has the heart, the lungs, blood vessels, the neurologic system has the brain, the spinal cord, they have organs. 
The endocannabinoid system is fascinating in that it is just like a lock and a key and a locksmith and it lives everywhere. So it, it's, it influences everything in our body. And as an energy practitioner, I think of it as almost the physiologic energy system. Um, so it has these things called receptors, that's like your lock, and ligands are just substances that are in our body and in our animal's bodies that work at these receptors, the key, and then we have the enzymes that we that make the keys or break up the keys. And that's the system and it's absolutely everywhere. Now I wanted to give you a few of the receptors, not so that you have to memorize something or worry about it being too complicated, but just because a lot of people are talking about these things and to show you also how vast a system is this. So the two main receptors that everybody talks about are CB1 and CB2. So real, you know, unusual names, cannabinoid one and cannabinoid two. Um, and if you look at CB1, you know, the main thing is the nervous system. It's all throughout the nervous system, but it's everywhere else. Look, the heart, the liver, the lungs, your digestion, bladders, your immune system, even your skin. Um, and here's an interesting thing. And this goes back to what you were saying about your patient. Dogs have more CB1 receptors in the movement areas of their brain and also the arousal, the, the areas that tell us to be awake. And so they are actually the most sensitive species to THC, which is that psychoactive property of medical cannabis or marijuana. And that's why we don't want them getting into the marijuana stash because they're not gonna handle it as well. Now, is it life-threatening? No, it's not. Um, however, they can be really, really affected and they have a certain way that they walk. It's very classic. And once you see it, you know, pretty much they kind of stumble in the door and, and you know, that's what it is. And with some support, they're fine. But it, it really is important to, to be mindful of that. They're very sensitive to THC. And then the CB2 receptors are just everywhere. Think of it as, as mostly in the immune system. Um, now there's some in the nervous system, but for the most part, the immune, digestion, our connective tissue. Um, so these are really important receptors. And as you can see, they're everywhere. And there's a couple sub receptors I, I wanted to mention too, because again, everybody talks about CB1, CB2. And the reason I bring this TRAP, the TRPV1 up is that you're gonna read about this someday. This is a pain receptor and it is getting a lot of exciting research around it. In fact, in one study, they did this in humans and dogs and humans that had just absolute pain that nothing was touching, like think of bone cancer, just horrible intractable pain. Um, and they made antibodies to this receptor and they injected it into the spinal fluid. And it went and it knocked out this receptor. And they went from having just horrible pain to two or three days having none, none. And so, and this is a very important receptor, one that cannabinoids work on. So I wanted to mention that because you're gonna see a lot of research coming out. It's very, very exciting. Um, here's some other receptors. Again, not, nothing you have to write down and memorize, but just to show you where they are, they're everywhere. And especially in our, our digestive system, I, I didn't realize till I do dove into the literature how important it is for our digestion. And right there where it says the second one, the, GPR 119 and it modulates enteroendocrine cells. That's a fancy word for the cells that make all the things that our body secretes to help us digest, even insulin. So very, very, very important for our digestion. And even things like our fat metabolism, um, antioxidants, it works in our bone marrow. So you can tell this is hugely important system. And then here are the keys. Right, so we have we have substances in our body that that do all this. We don't need to take anything else. It, they're there, and you can see the big names, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce. But the first one, um, its nickname is anandamide, and if you study yoga, um, ananda is Sanskrit for bliss, so they call it the bliss molecule. And this is the one that we naturally make that would affect our brains to give us that kind of 
I don't think of bliss as woo. -woo. I think of bliss as that peaceful, calm, grounded feeling. We're supposed to naturally be that way. Um, and then the 2AG, that works mostly on the immune system. So it's out there in that digestive system and immune system, and it's doing its job. So, and then you have the locksmith, the enzymes that make the uh, ligands or the keys or degrade them. And you might read about something called the endocannabinoid tone. Um, you know, it's funny how people start these buzz phrases and buzzwords, but that's really just looking at, okay, how's everything working together? Do I have enough locks? Do I have enough keys to go in the locks? You know, do I have the locksmith on board? How's it all panning out in my body or in the animal's body. And they've mapped all these things in dogs and cats as well. So, and they're very, very, very similar. Um, so, okay, great. So I'm excited about this. This system is everywhere. Well, what is its function? What does it do? And this is to me where the absolute beauty comes in. It's about balance. Now, anybody that does any kind of traditional medicine, Dr. Allen can tell you whether it's traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurveda or anything, the, it's all about balance, right? It's all about keeping our body in a state of homeostasis, which is another word for balance. And so this system helps to do it. And the way it does it is just ingenious in that it coordinates all these other systems. So that nervous system and the cardiovascular system and the hormone system, it's working, it's magic coordinating and helping the communication among those systems. So I think of it very much like a traffic cop. And I know this is a really simplified um, idea, but it makes me understand it especially between the nervous system and the immune system. So let's say, for example, that there is a person in a car at a red light and then somebody else comes up behind them and taps their bumper. Okay, so let's say the driver of the first car that's sitting there is of the nervous system and then the other car comes up and hits it. So that driver can get out and be kind of, all right, it's not so bad. You know, they can exchange names and all that. And it's not a big deal. Or they can get out of the car like screaming, right? Um, now, the if they start screaming, what's going to happen? People are going to start running up. Let's see the people that are coming up to see what's going on is the immune system. And the traffic cop is going to be there to go, okay, folks, there's nothing to see here. I need you to move along. So think about it in terms of if I were to cut my hand, which when I'm cooking is not unusual, a burn or a cut. So immediately that pain response goes up to my brain, comes back down, and my nervous system is just like that driver, gets out and goes, whoa, there she did it again. She just cut herself. Now, if I wash it and I take care of it, it's not a bad deal, big deal the endocannabinoid system is gonna tell my immune system, look, there's nothing to see here. She just cut herself again. It's not a big deal, go about your way. But if I don't take care of it and it starts to get inflamed and it starts to get infected, then my system, endocannabinoid system is the traffic cop that's gonna call in for backup. Okay, she didn't take care of it. I need some immune cells. I need, and I need her nervous system to not hurt so much. So it's coordinating all of this. And I think that's just incredibly fascinating. So let's go to more specific functions besides that coordination. Where is it doing it? What kind of things happen when it coordinates besides the example that I just gave you with, with the nervous system and immune system? Specifically with the nervous system, it absolutely is a huge modulator of pain on every level. And I mentioned that one receptor, but on every level of a pain response, which is really very um, difficult to understand, but at every level, the endocannabinoid system is part of that. It helps the neurotransmitters, those processes in our brain um, that fire, that are excreted when the neurons fire. Our memory, and our emotional memory, which is really important for something like post-traumatic post stress because it kind of blunts the, the emotional part of that memory so we don't necessarily have to relive it all the time. It's amazingly important for sleep. We've got to have proper sleep and with all the research going on about what happens to our bodies when we don't get good sleep, they become very inflamed. You know, we really need our sleep. The endocannabinoid system is really important for that. Our ability to focus. 
from a neuroprotective standpoint, meaning um, the protecting our brain, if we get a brain injury, that, that endocannabinoid system, that traffic cop is just right there on board to do what it needs to do to help our brains. Hugely important for protection. Regulates our mood, modulates whether things are inflamed. Um, and they even know that their CB2 uh, receptors, which tend to be about inflammation, are in upregulated in neurodegenerative diseases. So like Parkinson's and things like that. We know the brain besides degenerating is getting inflamed and upset, so to speak. So it really influences all of that. And then as we age, the CB1 receptors are going down. And that could be part of the problem that we have maybe with memory and sleep and all of those types of things. And especially with dogs with cognitive dysfunction, you know, or humans, they're really studying this with Alzheimer's and things like that. Can you kind of upregulate those CB1 receptors and help that brain to function? And that's probably what happened with the case that, that uh, you were talking about, you know, the dog that had the MRI and then lived another year and a half. Um, those CB1 receptors needed a little help and they got it. <laughs> so that's wonderful. Yeah, you know, that case, you, you know how certain patients are major teachers for you. I say, you know, like all teachers, great and small there. And that one really was like, oh my gosh, each time I go back to the barn, it was a horse person. She said, look at my dog. And he'd be running around playing and you know, you had the MRI, you had, you know, showing how aggressive it was. And, yeah. you know, and they said without chemo radiation, maybe you have a month. And, uh, you know, and she couldn't afford that. And at 14 and a half, were you really going to do that, you know? Right, right. And so that those are, it's those particular patients that just, you go, I need to learn more about this now. And I'm learning so much from you already uh, on this. Thanks so much for explaining it for everyone in such a organized, comprehensive way. Oh, well, you're, you're welcome. Yeah, and yeah. I, you know, I find that, that our, you're right, our patients teach us so very much. It's just, it's just incredible. So yeah, they really do. So let's go on then. The I keep mentioning the gastrointestinal system. Again, I had no idea till I dove into this how important it is, and it really is. Um, you know, we talk a lot about all the good and bad bacteria that are in our gut, especially the good bacteria. It really helps that bacteria form and stay in there and not get killed off. Um, it helps with inflammation. Again, it helps on every single level of our digestion. And I find that fascinating. Even stem cells, you know, there's a lot of research going into these cells that are kind of precursors and could they go on to make a nervous system cell or could they help with arthritis? There's a lot of research in there. Well, you know, the endocannabinoid system helps with that. And the particular one that I was real interested to learn was bladder. Um, a lot of contractility issues with bladder, it helps with that. But look at the pain receptors, the trap B1, there that is again, it's in the bladder and the urethra. Now, the reason I bring this up is that any of you out there that have ever had a cat with lower urinary tract disease, you know how painful that is. Um, and so here's something where, ooh, okay, we might have a nice indication for that to help these cats. Um, and then even the cardiovascular system, they find that, you know, they're looking into um, high blood pressure, things like that, and how this, the, this system regulates all of that. So, okay, we know it's important, we got that. What can we do? you know, to enhance it, especially when I said, okay, as we get older, those CB1 receptors are going down. Um, well, you know, lifestyle is huge. It's very big. It's not all about, you know, taking something. Um, it's about what we can do. And so decreasing our stress is very, very important because stress really does a number on the endocannabinoid system. So all of those wonderful things that we have on Awake TV was heart math, 
all of these meditations, all of that are really helping us and our endocannabinoid system. Yoga is something great, a little bit of exercise. You know, you don't have to be a gym rat. You can walk, do things that are good for your body. That's absolutely good for your endocannabinoid system. And then your nutrition. And I'm sure Dr. Becker would be all over this one because she is just the guru on nutrition for animals. And I know she understands just how important that microbiome and eating correctly is. Um, so it's not just about digestion, it's about the whole endocannabinoid system. So beyond that, what can we do? Um, what kind of plants could we eat, things that we could ingest that would help that, um, right? So we can exercise our dogs, we can make sure our cats play. Um, you know, we can put calming music or use a tuning forks like we talked about before to decrease their stress and feed them correctly. Um, my cat loves to hang out when I do yoga. I know dogs that do doga. So we can do all those things with our pets. So what else can we do? Well, for us humans, um, we can do things like eat black pepper. Copaiba is a plant that's similar to hemp and anybody that does essential oils, you know, copaiba is a big one. Um, it's great for pain relief and it's very similar. It, it supports the endocannabinoid system cloves and oregano and cinnamon. And I'm sure any herbalist, any natural practitioner out there is going to go, oh yeah, these things are really good for us. We've known that. Well, now we know that they're also good for the endocannabinoid system. We're getting deeper into how they work. Turmeric, everybody's talking about turmeric and its anti-inflammatory properties. Well, also supports the endocannabinoid system. Lemon balm, my favorite dark chocolate favorite favorite so you can feel good about eating some dark chocolate and you know this is like over 75 percent you know not not milk chocolate dark chocolate and then look at the last one green tea you know we've always known green tea is good for us well now we know another reason why it's good for us it's good for the endocannabinoid system and I want to bring up this interesting research, and this is in humans, but I think there's a parallel with animals. So that's why I wanted to bring it up here. Uh, Dr. Russo, Ethan Russo is just a pioneer. He's done such tremendous work. Um, he's a physician, I believe he's a neurologist in, for humans, and he's just really made it his life's work to look at this system. And he came up with this theory about a deficiency because you know in humans there are all these weird diseases that that are so hard for doctors to diagnose you know migraines that you can't find a trigger for fibromyalgia that's that started my whole journey in holistic medicine i got diagnosed with that and nobody knew what to do to help me uh, irritable bowel even autism things like ptsd all, all kind of things he had a theory that maybe the underlying basis for this is a deficiency in the endocannabinoid system, because now that they know what it is, they can start measuring these, um, measuring the keys is what they're looking for, the anandamide, the 2-AG, what's in there, they measure the enzymes. And my first thought was, oh, it's chicken egg, you know, maybe these people have these diseases and they get stressed and that drops their endocannabinoid system. But, you know, he's really looking at no, it may be that they have too much of one enzyme that destroys the key or not enough. So it may be a genetic predisposition and then you add lifestyle or stress on top of it. Now, the reason I mention this is to go back to what I said about cats with feline lower urinary tract diseases. You know, I used to talk with the main researcher of that disease at, at Ohio State, and we'd sit and kind of talk back and forth. And, you know, there are a lot of comorbidities that we're finding with those cats. They might have inflammatory bowel disease. They might have other issues. And we've always surmised, you know, could they have fibromyalgia? Their nervous systems are so like this. And so I think that maybe we do see this and it might be in other things besides that, you know, so it's going to be really interesting as we move forward, if we can, you know, measure these things in animals and see, okay, uh, maybe we're finding some underlying issues here. So I find that all very fascinating. So let's wow. get to the meat that's, of like, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that's absolutely fascinating that he's proposing that it may be an underlying whole body deficiency yeah. of explaining all these fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, all these other things. One question I do have for you before we go on, I've seen you've mentioned it a number of times in for gastrointestinal things. 
Has there been any research or any clinical cases that you know of um, where it's been beneficial for inflammatory bowel disease in dogs and cats? You know, because I have one, one client, one patient now that has, you know, we've done everything with the healthy bot microbiome, this and that, and the dog's doing really well, just changing all of that, but it has a situation where at night, if it's eaten something a little bit different or something, it just gets so painful and starts licking its tongue, you yeah. know, which is then related to the vagus nerve and the whole vagal, vagal connection. And I'm just wondering, it's obviously it's from pain mm -hmm. uh, related to the IBD and do you think, or have you had any experience or aware of any research of on, uh, you know, CBD or something be ben being beneficial in animals for IBD? Yes, there, there is some good work coming out there. Most of it is in laboratory animals, but they showed that definitely with one of the cannabinoids, which I'll talk about, cannabigerol, which is similar to CBD. Um, they found that it was very beneficial in, I think it was rats, not mice, with inflammatory bowel disease. And so I started trying it with um, some cats that had that. And we really think that they are improving. And it's interesting because it, it also the CBD could as well because there's CB1 and CB2 receptors in there. So you could try, you know, if they wanted to go with a veterinary formula CBD, yes, you could definitely, definitely try that because it's a great anti-inflammatory. It helps support the microbiome, everything that we need in those. And then if you think his motility is decreased, you know, and he's not passing things through and that's where the pain's coming from, then the, there's a couple products and we can talk afterwards about what has the CBG because that promotes motility. So yeah. Definitely, there's great research coming out. And in people, they're definitely seeing it. So, um, and it depends whether it's like psychological or the ECS versus true inflammation. So you have to kind of, but in, in our dogs cases, we know they have inflammation. So yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, let's talk about then, let's go into the CBD, CBG, CBN, all of the cannabinoids. And, you know, what are phytocannabinoids? Well, they're, they're basically the cannabis plant. And, you know, people will kind of spin it. Well, it's sativa or it's indica or it's a hybrid, you know, sativa is hemp and they get all in a tizzy about it. It basically, this is cannabis. Now, here's, here's a difference between medical cannabis, i.e. marijuana and hemp. Um, they renamed it hemp if it has less than 0.3% THC, meaning you're not gonna get that huge psychoactive effect. You can have some calming mood, that type of thing, but you're not gonna get high because there's not enough THC in there. So they were able to rename it, which allowed it to come off of the, you know, the controlled substances. Um, so that's basically the difference. It's still the same type of plant. It's just how much THC is in there. Um, and then the other things that are in the plant that are very helpful are terpenes, which are the essential oils of the plant. And then flavonoids are the kind of the antioxidants. So there's all these wonderful properties that the cannabis plant has. Okay, and here's some of the other phytocannabinoids. So, and this is just, uh, just scratching the surface. There are so many more. And I think that's what's the exciting part is as the researchers figure out, well, okay, this particular cannabinoid is good for this problem versus this problem. Um, it just gets very exciting. And so I just listed a few of them. You know, the, obviously CBD is what everybody knows about. I love the CBG, um, but they're looking at, at all these other CBC and CBN, some of them help with sleep. So there's, you're just gonna see a lot of different things coming out based on the research. And then, you know, some people will talk about the acid form. Um, they thought that it didn't have any activity and that's just the form in the plant before the plant is kind of processes a little bit or heats. But now researchers are saying, gosh, in and of itself, that form may have some activity. So it is just like we've had the tip of the iceberg in terms of the research that's going to be coming out. 
So let's talk a little bit about a buzz phrase called the entourage effect. And, you know, I have to laugh um, because the cannabinoid people kind of, you know, coined this, but anybody that does herbal medicine or works with plants is kind of, I'm sure, rolling their eyes going, yeah, okay. And basically it's just that there's no active, one active ingredient. And I will have people say to me, well, Sue, you know, what's the active ingredient of that plant? And I say, yes, it's the plant. <laughs> no, it's nature. <laughs> That's a great it's, answer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's the plant, <laughs> you know, so we, we get into this mindset of we have to find the active ingredient, then we got to make a drug out of it, and then it's going to work better. And I will tell you, in some cases, I want that medication, because in some cases, it, it does work better. It needs to be like a bit of a bully. But, but when you come to a plant, it's everything working together. And so it's not only all the different phytocannabinoids that are in there. It's like, how are they working with the terpenes? How are they working with the other properties of the plant? So it's all of that together, um, which I think is really important. And that's where you're gonna read about, okay, you might have somebody say, I, a salesperson say, well, I do full spectrum or no, I have this extract and what the heck is that? And that's where um, if it's full spectrum, you're gonna have all those cannabinoids that are in that particular strain, no, they're not going to try to pull out one and make it an extract. That's what an extract would be. It's like, all right, I'm pulling the CBD out of this particular strain and I'm amplifying that because I really want that CBD effect. Well, that might be perfectly okay and maybe that is going to work better. Um, but that's a very Western mindset, almost like, okay, I have a drug. Um, whereas an herbalist would say, well, do you know that it's going to work better? So it, in my mind, it's like the, the um, quarterback, right? If you have a really good quarterback and a really lousy defense and you take away the front line, the offensive line, he might do okay, but chances are it's not going to go so well. And I think of that as the whole full spectrum is you got your front line, you got your quarterback, you got everybody working together. And I also think of it as like, this is a picture of roses, you know, so they're all roses, but you might have red roses, yellow roses, white roses, you know, and it's the same thing. It's all hemp or all cannabis. And you have all the different strains in there that have different properties and that may work in different types of situations. So that's, that's the nature of full spectrum versus extract. And I'm still a believer in the full spectrum until proven otherwise. But, you know, I'm sure there'll be a lot of good research on that. So let's talk about the whole regulation thing. Can my vet even prescribe these? Well, in the United States, they certainly can't do medical cannabis. We were having a discussion beforehand about whether that can happen in Canada, but certainly not here, um, which is kind of silly in that we can get a um, DEA number and prescribe morphine, but God forbid we can prescribe something hemp with, you know, THC in it, cannabis. But there are veterinarians who've been very diligent at working on this for years. And I want to thank them for just being up front and going, you know, this is silly. So I think that that's eventually going to change. Do I think there's a lot of situations where you actually need true medical cannabis in animals? No, I think you can do it all with hemp. The exception might be epilepsy. I think we might need a little more THC there, but that remains to be seen. So in the United States, they had the federal hemp bill that passed a few years ago saying, okay, if it's less than 0.3% THC, it's not marijuana, it's not illegal. And then each state kind of got in the mix. And some states are like, yeah, yeah, we're good with that. Like, oh, I'm here in Ohio. And our governor passed a bill saying, okay, pharmacy board, lay off. If it's hemp, you're not allowed to regulate it because the pharmacy board tells me what I can prescribe. And then you have the veterinary licensing boards and they throw their two cents in. Now, here's where it gets tricky because in here in Ohio, I should be able to talk about it, prescribe it. The governor says I can, the state legislation says I can, the feds say I can. Guess who says I can't? The FDA. So even though the feds passed this hemp bill, the FDA said, well, yeah, okay, but we still want to control it, even though it's hemp. And we don't think it should be in any supplement or any food. Now look around, at least here in the States, it's in gas stations, for goodness sakes. It's everywhere. So, you know, there's a lot of legal stuff going around around with the FTA, and I think that's going to change. So the bottom line is, yes, a veterinarian can talk about it. Chances are recommend it. 
but whether or not they can put it on their shelf because the FDA says it shouldn't be there, that's where it gets a little tricky. So, and we'll talk a little bit about, cause you're probably going, well, what am I supposed to do? So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so here's the things, if you're researching this for yourself that are extremely important, whether you wanna take a CBD product for yourself or your pet is the quality control. Because like I said, it's at gas stations now and you're gonna come out, they're gonna have everything and you have no idea unless you can see a certificate of analysis or you know the company that's making it to know that it's any good. Because the thing about um, cannabis is it's nature's own detoxer. So it likes to pull heavy metals out of the ground to, to kind of help mother earth. Well, we don't want that in the plant. So if a good company is gonna be able to show you a certificate of analysis that's done by a third party and done rather frequently, not once every, you know, every 12 years, and it'll show you what's in it. How much THC is there? Is there any heavy metals? Is there any pesticides? Are there any pathogens like bacteria or funguses or things like that? You wanna see that, or you wanna know the company well enough to know that they're gonna have a good product. In other words, like I, there's a few essential oil companies that I like, one in particular, they came out with a product. I know this company, I know they're gonna do a good job, right? Now there's other places called Commerce Lab. A lot of physicians and veterinarians subscribe to this and they, they will take things off the shelf and they'll test them. And they'll tell you, oh, there ain't no hemp in this, you know. So that's a nice place to look. And then there's something that's called the U.S. Hemp Authority, and it's a very high level. The bar is way, way high on what needs to happen for a company to get certified by the U.S. Hemp Authority. So if there's a product on there, you can guarantee it's good. Now, does that mean that if the product isn't on there, that it's not good? No, they may not have had the funding to go and get through all the certification. But if, you, if it's on there, you know it's really good. But the key is that certificate of analysis. Okay, the other key to this is something called bioavailability, which is how well your body absorbs it and, and the ability to use it. Hemp is fat soluble. And so it doesn't absorb very well because we're made of water. And so in some of the research that's come out, it, it would make sense to give it with a little bit of healthy fat to help the absorbability in some products. And we'll talk about that in a second. So, you know, maybe a little olive oil or almond oil or coconut oil or something like that to help it absorb. And then how long it stays in the body is also important. Some of these, it, that's called a half-life. You know, it's out of the body in four or five hours. So it tells you how often you need to give it. So there's a really, really important thing. So if you've tried a product or use a product with your animal and it didn't work, it may not be that CBD didn't work. It may be that that product was never absorbed and never got to where it needed to be. So different ways you can give it, like we just talked about oral. There's one veterinary prepar preparation that vets are going to be able to start carrying. I think it's called Endo Blend. And they, they figured out a way kind of with that fat so that it's absorbed a little bit better. So that's what you're gonna be seeing research around that absorption. You can give it under the tongue, which you absorb it in the mouth right away. And then whatever swallowed goes through digestion, but that's a fantastic way to take it. And that the product I use a lot is done that way. You can put it on the skin. And the key is to go low and slow, whether it's for our pets or us. And here's the reason this whole system gets even more fascinating because when it senses that you're starting to help it, whether you're taking turmeric or CBD or doing yoga, it goes, oh, this is great. I'm gonna make more receptors. So you just start really low and then it makes more receptors and then you increase and increase. So you have better chance at a success. So I, it's like an intelligent system, which of course we know the body's intelligent, but I just thought that was fan fantastic. So what areas would it potentially be helpful for? Um, all the areas that are being researched, all everything you see here, everything we've talked about, pain, GI, inflammation, cancer, a bunch of neurologic conditions, you know, so a lot of research going into this. And it can be whether it's in laboratory animals or in the cells, and now we're starting to look at people and dogs and cats. And this is some of the area, all these different kinds of pain that they've researched, whether it's in animals or people. And again, in some of the pain studies, they'll say, well, it's not that good for rheumatoid. You know, it's not that good for abdominal pain, like we just talked about with your dog. 
um, well, that could be that the you don't know what product they're using and how well was it absorbed. So if they don't match it with blood levels, it may be the, a case that that's the product. So those are the way that um, the scientists are reading the research. Um, there is a study that came out a couple of years ago in dogs, and this is pretty exciting. And they looked at dogs that have arthritis and they looked at the CBD. Um, they call it a kind of clinical extract. It It is pretty full spectrum as far as I understand. Um, but they looked at that and they found that the dogs could move around better. They had less pain and it wasn't just the owners going, oh yeah, I think he's better. No, they had vets look at it. They had, they really looked at how well they could move their joints. And so they had some really good outcomes. Um, and, you know, they had to use pretty big doses though. And this is again, where that ability to absorb comes in. Um, and that increased ALP, I don't want you to worry about it, but if you hear about things like, oh, it affects the liver, oh, it hurts the liver, N not a plant-based. If it's synthetic, all bets are off there, but plant-based, this is an enzyme. So what happens is, is the more you take it orally, the liver goes, ooh, I got a lot of stuff here, I have to increase my enzymes. That could have an effect on other medications. And we'll talk about that when we talk about epilepsy. So it's more for something for your veterinarian or your healthcare provider to know about your medications or your dog's medications. Um, in the world of cancer, you know, it started out where people would smoke pot to help with the horrible side effects of chemo. And then they started looking at research with cancer and it's so exciting, you know, in some cases, whether it's in a Petri dish of cancer cells or in a laboratory animal, they're finding that, that CBD or THC or different types of cannabinoids will actually pro apoptotic means pro death. So kill the cancer or keep it from spreading. So there's a lot more research that needs to be done and it's happening and it's, it's very exciting. And in vitro or in vivo means in a Petri dish or in the body. So they're looking at it in both ways. So very exciting stuff. Yeah. It's really exciting to see that you know, after it being illegal for so long and no research being done, yes. now that it is more and more legal, universities, veterinary schools are all able to study it more and have the freedom. And there's just so much information coming out. And it's really exciting to see so many, you know, like we tend to in human medicine, veterinary medicine, try to diagnose and say something is neurologic or GI, this and that. But this system, as you're explaining it, and it, it's showing we can't, it isn't fair to say, oh, this is just neurologic. It's impacting on all systems and in mostly beneficial ways. Right, right. I think that's the fascinating piece about it. It's, it's just this this intelligent communicating system that, you know, you, and, and that's where, you know, people will say, well, I took it for myself to help this, but, oh, I'm sleeping better, you know, or I'm focusing better or, or the animal. Well, I did, my vet wanted me to do it for, you know, it's arthritis, but my goodness, it has energy, <laughs> you know, so it's going to affect everything. And I think that that's, what's so exciting about it. Um, and then here is good old epilepsy, you know, I will Which is one of the big ones that it was coming out for in veterinary medicine yeah, exactly. at first. Exactly. And we, we have yet to find, you know, in some studies, you know, and Dr. Silver with RX um, Hemp, that was his, is his product. He's done a lot of good research and, you know, he continues to do good research. And, and what we're finding is it's, it's epilepsy. Some will get better. Some won't get better. And there's a lot of variables to this. And, and we know in humans, you know, I got very excited because they found that, you know, some children with a certain kind of epilepsy would just get tremendously better. Um, but dog epilepsy and cat epilepsy and horse epilepsy isn't human epilepsy. It's just different. And so we still have a ways to go. And, um, you know, some of it may be, did they absorb it? And other parts of it may be, well, they did absorb a lot of it and it upregulated this P450 enzyme system, which chewed up some of the phenobarbital they were on. And then they started seizuring more. So there's so many variables that we have to worry about with epilepsy. Um, 
you know, I certainly, if I'm giving advice to a veterinarian or a client or whatever, you know, I'm going to look at, I would like for them to be on medications that, that aren't related to liver metabolism. And that way I don't have to worry about it. And then try to give it in a way that isn't a big, huge dose orally, you know, transmucosal. Um, what I, the main thing I wanted to stress is that it's okay if you, if you want to try this and talk to your veterinarian and we'll talk again about the, how that could potentially happen. But what I don't want you to do is say, okay, I'm going to go out and get the CBD and I'm going to take my dogs off his seizure meds. I don't want you to do that. You know, as holistic as I am, I am like the pit bull when it comes to seizure meds and making sure because the brain starts to seizure and then it, it, it's like it's fireworks. It starts fireworks in one area, then it gets another area in to join the party. And so you really have to, you have to control it early and you have to just, uh, so I don't want everybody going out and going, I'm going to get the CBD and take my dog off. It's epilepsy drugs. Don't want to do that. So more is coming and it's exciting. And I think there's going to be a place for it. Um, we just have to figure it all out and you have to work carefully with your healthcare provider, your veterinarian. So, and that's actually a picture of a full moon, which Anybody that has an epileptic knows, oh boy. And that was a doozy. I will tell you that was a doozy. Um, mood. This is an area where I think it does have a lot of help, whether it's in, you know, we know in human studies that it really helps reduce anxiety. It helps that, um, that emotional part of a memory. Um, and we're finding that in animal models too, you know, that it can really be calming. So when people say, oh, hemp CBD doesn't affect, it's not psychoactive. Well, that's not necessarily true. Psychoactive just means it affects the brain and affects our state of mind. It does. It can be uplifting. It can be calming. It just doesn't make you high. You know, it doesn't go over the top. Um, one thing I want to mention is for those dogs that have fear-based aggression, you know, they're really afraid and, and, you know, they bark or whatever. And so you want to help reduce their anxiety. You got to be careful with this because it's kind of like um, having a cocktail at the Christmas office party and you say something to your boss that you might not have said if you didn't have that cocktail. Um, so you want to go really work with your behaviors with your veterinary because, and you want to start really slow and be very mindful that, okay, that dog might bark at the neighbor's dog normally as part of their, I'm afraid of that dog and my aggression to, okay, I'm going to go attack that dog. So we have to be really mindful of what we're doing here. Um, and it can work. It just, you have to, you know, have help with that. Um, so how do we proceed? You know, I keep saying, well, Okay, be careful of this, watch this. Well, one way to do it is to, to talk with you. If your veterinarian isn't knowledgeable about it or understand it, you know, ask them to get an integrative medicine consultation. You know, is there an integrative medicine practitioner in the area or at the university or somebody who has knowledge there? You know, they can do that. Um, or, you know, you may want to stick with your family vet for everything, but go see an integrative vet for this particular thing so that they can work together because that's that's the basis. We want to be a team with the, the animal and the client in the circle and we're all around it. Um, if you decide to try things on your own, again, certificate of analysis, you want to make sure it's a good quality product. Any of the products that a veterinarian can decides to carry, you know, that are vet um, they, they're good products. Um, but there are over the counter products that are really, really good too. Um, so they have good certificate of analysis. They have veterinarians, um, and physicians on board to help with dosing and things like that. So you want to make sure that that product has, there's some veterinary component to it to say, okay, in a dog or a cat or a horse, you're going to use this much. And again, you go low and you go slow. I'll start with one drop of the sublingual that I use. And then every three days I increase by a drop. I mean, we're talking a little bit. And that, that company is this lease. That's the one I have there. And they make like a CBD spectrum and a CBG. And I like that because I can pick and choose which one I want. Again, there are other really good products on the market. Um, just look at that certificate of analysis, talk to people, make sure that they have animal recommendations. So it's just a little bit of effort, but um, usually well worth it. So, and hopefully if, that's the case, then you get to a place like if, if we could all live right there in the bliss, <laughs> we'd all be good. We wouldn't need any of this stuff. So 
Okay, so I'm going to stop the screen share so that then we can, unless there's a slide or something you want me to go back and look at or. No, this is great. Yeah, you really covered so much. And yeah, you know, like I had questions from the audience, questions from me, and you really addressed uh, pretty much all of them. Okay. So, um, are there ones that say specifically for cats versus dogs? Um, I know I just heard of, I didn't realize, someone was, uh, a friend in Arizona was saying that they have horse uh, hemp, uh, see, hemp products now. Yeah. And I didn't even realize that, you know? Yeah, different companies. And again, you know, looking at Exploding. that company, you know, the quality, the certificate of analysis, how, how reliable a company is it? Um, but there's not so much different ones that I've used across species. It's more tailoring it to the type of things that a species, that species has, you know, and with the, the sublingual product I use, you know, horses, they only need like four or five drops. Um, and, you know, a cat, they do have now a cat form or small dog and cat formula so that you can give a little bit more and don't have to titrate it down so much. So it's not so much species. They even use it in birds. You know, um, I have a friend that has a bird, a parrot that was a feather picker. You know, that's an anxiety for those of you don't know right. bird stuff. It's an anxiety disorder and they, they pluck their own feathers. It's really sad. And she started just one teeny little, um, half a drop of CBD because that's the one more for the nervous system and the calming and that parrot, it got better. So yeah, so it's not so much particular species as indications and then knowing doses. Now I will say though, with the CBG uh, in any products that come out that kind of push the CBG, I've been staying away from that in horses only because horses have such a sensitive GI tract and CBG promotes gastric motility. So I, you know, in a cat that can't poop because it has megacolon, I'm grabbing that. But in a horse, you know, until the veterinarians that work with it tell me, I'm, I would stick with a CBD product versus a CBG because I don't want to increase the motility of their gut and you know, because they're so sensitive to colic and things like that. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much. Gosh, we're going to have to continue this one because we're running out of time. Sure, and yeah. I'll let everyone digest all this yeah. wealth of information. And maybe we'll have you on later on for an extended, like, okay, here's part two on CBD, because it is something as there's more and more research coming out and veterinary schools are studying it. Now they're getting research yeah. grants. And I'm so happy to see that. Yep. And yep. as more information comes out, we'll have better ideas about its indications, limitations, and everything. And you've really explained so much. I learned a lot. And I really appreciate that, Dr. Wagner. Um, great. My pleasure. Yeah. I, you know, my one of my teachers always said, you teach what you need to learn. Well, I had to, uh, you know, I got that womp upside the head. And I had to go in and learn it. It's like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> So yeah. yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, and it's so appropriate with your background in neurology. So again, I just want to thank you so much for being part of uh, this today and sharing your wealth of information and being your, as the calm movement, the conscious animal lovers movement is unfolding as I'm sharing it with er the audience every, every time. Um, I'm so pleased Dr. Wagner is like excited and is going to be part of this as well as so many of you who are watching it who are non-veterinarians we need all the help we can get because the goal here is to create a movement of conscious animal lovers to help shift this planet into recreating a more harmonious happier healthier world so thank you all for joining us thank you dr wagner for sharing in such informative ways and for your cheerful sharing and everything. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. And thank you again for Awake TV for hosting all of this and providing all an avenue for all this information to be shared with all animal lovers. So till next week, may the forces be with you all healthy, happy, calm forces be with us and have a great week. Thank you.
and bye for now.